Hello, and welcome to the Noise Floor Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Doyle. We're going to raise the floor. Let's make some noise. On this podcast, our goal is to have interesting guests, including musicians, songwriters, audio recording, mixing, and mastering engineers, sound designers, and composers of film, television, and gaming soundtracks from all over the world. Warning, this broadcast may or may not contain... Warning, this broadcast may contain a language. You have been warned. Some restrictions may apply when you are prohibited. Today's guest is a recording and mixing engineer, record label owner, composer of orchestration, film, video games, and TV, multi-instrumentalist, educator, artist, and bread maker. His list of credits include, but are not limited to, he did his first major work for orchestra and synthesizer in 1985-86, entitled Drockthamian Demonica. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Studied yeah, that music. Right. Yeah. Studied yeah. music theory and composition at Manhattanville College in New York. He played percussion in the Manhattanville Symphony Orchestra. Received a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Classical Composition from Purchase College, New York. In 2006, the Warwick Symphony Orchestra in Rhode Island commissioned him to compose his Symphony No. 2 in honor of their 40th anniversary. He has also completed work on the feature-length horror film Bunny Man by Carl Lindbergh, which was released on DVD. My first podcast, Peter Scartabello. Welcome. Great to be here. Thanks for... uh for having me yeah man so um full disclosure we have a, a small business relationship and i'm grateful for it um you heard some of my work and consequently it came out on your record label you goth records tell me some more things that you do and are involved in yeah that was uh, i was really happy to release your project on that i liked what you were doing and it was an honor to to get you on there so yeah as far as what i've been doing i've been Doing some uh, film work, some um, some commercial film work as well, and also constantly writing small chamber works for friends and uh, for various performances, and yeah, and also doing some uh, a metal project called Sky Shadow Obelisk, which is my. It sort of started as doom metal, but it kind of has evolved more into lots of different genres and seems to be expanding in different directions, but. But yeah, so that's what I've been doing, basically. Excellent. Uh, you've yeah. been working on some other stuff, too, as well. You've been doing some commercial work here and there for various entities. I don't know if you want to get into that. but Yeah, I do, do some commercial work for um, for some jewelry companies and like fashion companies, as well as different ad agencies. Go yeah, ahead. that's sort of... Sort of um, and aside from that, I also teach private music lessons. And that stuff kind of allows me to do the less accessible music i think which is kind of came to terms with that over the years just you know doing more commercial work to kind of allow me to to do what i really stuff that's well i don't want to say i would say it's more who i am maybe you know what i really want to write without any limitations or or sort of um you know parameters you know what i mean yeah so definitely, and I know you know this from, from doing the studio stuff, it's like, it allows you to do your own stuff too, you know? You're still doing music, so that's cool, you know? So I'm able to make a living doing just music, which is cool. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's yeah. what we live for anyway, is doing our own stuff. Um, yeah, absolutely. When, when, when I said you do commercial work as well, is that ranging from like, are you doing classical composition that you're recording yourself, and then that's being put to uh, a video or how, how does that work yeah as far as i mean there are different types of commercial music i mean i guess you could call the film music commercial as well but when i say commercial i mean like um advertising yeah advertising stuff like that so so yeah we do all those stuff with with samples usually for that sometimes i do have live players come in to do certain things but it depends on the budget and and a lot of times you don't have it's a quick turnaround, so you don't have time to record people. So you got to kind of, kind of just do it, do it all yourself. So I use samples, and I use, I do everything myself pretty much. So some of it's orchestral, but a lot of it's more um, mainstream, like indie folkish, or you know, just sort of like uh, that corporate kind of sound. But <laughs> but um, but some of it is is more classical. It depends on the the project. Like I did some stuff for for the Navy. 
um, the Naval War College in, in Newport, Rhode Island. So, and that was more like John Williams, like epic type type stuff like that with the brass and percussion. Right. So that was fun. Folks. Yeah, I, and, I heard you. I, thanks for uh, sending me a copy of that. That was pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, I yeah. definitely felt the wind and the salty breeze blowing through my hair when I heard that. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> So, um, yeah. what DAW do you use? I mean, I, I assume that you're you're not on tape anymore. You're you've switched to the digital world. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've still have a tape machine, but it's been out of commission for a while. Some of my early Sky Shadow Obelisk recordings, and and I was in a grindcore band called Hog. We used some tape for that. But I would say, you know, since probably like mid to late '90s, I switched over to digital. So, I I started using Pro Tools, but for the sequencing, I usually use Logic, but now I'm kind of moving over to Cubase. So, yeah, I've kind of been all over the place with, as you know, the different DAWs. And, but yeah, I would say my main thing is probably with the film stuff, Logic, and now more Cubase. But when I do live recording, or like Sky Shadow Obelisk, I'll use Pro Tools. Right. Yeah. yeah the, but the t- tape machine's kind of out of commission now, so and it's it's kind of expensive. As you probably know, to with what the upkeep ki- with that. What kind of tape machine? I have the um, the Tascam. It's um, it's the eight eight track, um, half inch. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's pretty cool actually. But um, it has the old analog meters, so I'm not sure which one that was. But it has a lot of electronic issues with the with the the cap stand and all that. And but um, I love the sound of it, and I love that you can't. It's harder to edit with that, so you kind of you kind of have to really rehearse and get your shit together because you know you got one chance to do it. <laughs> no, but it, you're, it's like a whole other world because you yeah, people don't realize that now because they record, they can punch in like every measure, you know. But but back then it was like, like you gotta really have your takes down, you know. Yeah, I mean was, it is possible it, to punch in, but but for me, I, if I was doing it on my own, it, that's pretty impossible. If I'm playing drums and I have to press a button, you know, like <laughs> sure, it comes from a, a whole different era of musicianship. Is uh, didn't have to rely on the digital edits and stuff. Uh, you know, we both come from that era, so it's it's kind of cool that uh, we do strive to get the takes right and don't rely on the digital magic. Uh, yeah, and I think I think some of the beauty in like recordings like that is even if you listen to like Led Zeppelin or you know, like the takes aren't always perfect, you know, but I think. The energy is the most important thing, and that's the way I feel with, you know, if I don't, if I miss something in a drum take or, and the energy's right, I'll keep it in there because, you know, that's the most important thing is to get that energy right and the, you know, and if you make a little mistake, I mean that's, so even with digital, I'll, I'll keep stuff like that in there. Yeah, I like to get. I that, completely that agree with you on that for sure. Yeah, you work out a logic, you do some work in Cubase, and you uh, track in Pro Tools. Um, yep. What's your favorite plug-in right now? <laughs> oh man, that's a tough one. But lately, I've been really liking the the API twenty five hundred, the the compressor. Yeah, I've I been love using that, that a lot on the drums because it has a punchy sort of curve for the uh, you know for the attack there. For sure. Yeah, so I like that. I also like the SSL EQs. I use those a lot. Yeah, those are great. The uh, G channel, mm. so mm. good. I, you know, yeah. even if you put it on a channel strip and it, it uh, it's not doing anything, it still sounds great. It does something. It warms it up or whatnot. That's true. You're and, right. Even if you don't touch it, it just changes the sound. Yeah, as totally. our friend as our friend says. Um, That's right, David. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to uh, David at Mixbus TV. <laughs> yeah, another Italian, by the way. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so what's your favorite desert island plugin? Well, uh, boy, oh. and what I mean by that is like, what would you use if you couldn't use anything else? And that's the only plugin you can use. Period. Yeah, no, I know. It's a tough decision, man. Um, yeah, I'd have to say that I really like. Talking. Well, you're liking that multi-channel compressor or with, with the isotope thing, right? Oh yeah, I love isotope stuff. All of it. Yeah, yeah, me too. Neutron's awesome. That's it. Yeah, That's the yeah. One. I, I like that one a lot. It's very versatile. 
I could probably mix a whole record with just that plug in and even master some tracks with it as well. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it covers covers a lot of ground, right? Yeah. In the meantime, let's talk about uh, things that are coming up on the horizon for you. What what do you, what's coming your way? Yeah, I think um, the main thing uh, that I'm working on now is uh, I'm doing a split cassette tape or you know also digital with um, this band called Gin and Miskatonic from uh, India. Actually, they're a doom metal band, and I met the uh, bass player online, and he's really into. Uh, he's also a great writer. And um, his name is Jay. I can't remember the last name right now, but but um, we we met about talking about Lovecraft and horror and stuff like that online. So so I'm excited. Yeah, we're doing a split with that. So I've been working. It's just my side is just going to be one track, but it's a fairly long track. And then I think they're doing two tracks on the other side. So so that's what I've been working on now. Trying to I'm rehearsing the drum tracks. I pretty much get all the writing done and recorded a lot of the rough tracks. So I'm just kind of doing the uh, drum tracks soon once I get the, get them rehearsed and sounding good. And then, yeah, that, beyond that, so I've got some movie options maybe, but nothing is sort of set in stone yet. So that's like the main focus now. Any favorite composers? I, I, I'm grateful that you've shared your experience with things, especially uh, Peterson lately. That guy's oh, yeah, amazing. yeah. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, I'm glad you're getting into that. Yeah. Yeah, I discovered him fairly recently, like maybe four or five years ago. But yeah, I, I, that's a hard question because it it changes. But I would say like some of the big composers of that have shaped my work are probably um, Andrzej Panufnik, which is he's a Polish composer, uh, Gerard Grisset, who's a French composer, and they're fairly modern. Grisset just passed away maybe maybe like ten or fifteen years ago. But yeah, so those two guys have really influenced my work and, and what they do. But before that, I mean, it's it's tons of other composers. Um, you know, I, I like a lot of Renaissance and early music, and of course, you know, the great classical composers and some Romantic composers like Mahler and stuff like that. So it's just, there's so many, but I would say those two probably influenced, and also Roger Reynolds from California. Um, his stuff has influenced my work with the and Zanakis as far as like tape music and electronic stuff. But yeah, we could talk forever about <laughs> composers. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I would say those those two, Panufnik and Grisset, probably have really, in the past, you know, 15 to 20 years, have really influenced my work. So you're one of the unusuals, I think. Um, maybe. I, I don't know. But I, I assume this, that uh, you <laughs> are into symphonic music and you also love metal and you, you spend a lot of time in metal as well. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, What's your favorite metal bands? For metal, I mean, kind of discovered metal early on, and I think it's funny because I kind of came to classical through metal, which <laughs> which is like because there was a lot of the neoclassical metal going on in like the eighties, like um, Ingve In- Momstein, things like that. I came to symphonic through metal myself, and uh, so it's kind yeah. of an opposite thing, but it it all comes to the same road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I kind of. You got me into like listening to a lot of different composers and um, I got into like Stravinsky and you know you hear a lot of when you're growing up you hear the classic you know like you hear like Beethoven and 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 Brahms and stuff like that but then you discover that there's this whole other realm of classical that but anyway getting back to the metal I think um, probably the first band I really got into aside from Kiss when I was like eight or whatever but but I think when I was a teenager I got into Iron Maiden and I think that's sort of really got me into to metal because I started playing drums at the same time. So I think they're probably a big, big band. I like all that new album stuff like like Maiden and, and Judas Priest. and But then I got into the heavier stuff like Slayer. And then that brought me into the whole like thrash realm. And then, you know, I started listening to like Mekong Delta. I like them a lot. They're from Germany. Kind of like progressive thrash. Right. That was that whole scene. Like, like um, they were more progressive, kind of like Voivod. But... So that's another band that influenced me a lot was Voivod. Yeah, I love me some Voivod. My wife turned me on to Voivod. It, I don't, I yeah. can't believe I didn't really listen to him that much until I met her. Yeah, when you hear Voivod, you know their their influence is probably like King Crimson and stuff because they use a lot of the same. So they're drawing from like the progressive rock element, right? But so that got me into progressive rock too. So it's like a a, you know a whole chain reaction thing but but then of course like celtic frost and and 
you got into like Morbid Angel and you know, because when Morbid Angel came out, you know, we had like Slayer and that was but they took it to the next level. So I think, you know, because at that point Slayer was like the fastest band and then and then you hear something like Morbid Angel and it's like, you know. So I think that was kind of the progression with that. Right. Getting into more extreme metal. But at the same time I was getting into to more outsider classical too, like like Xenakis and and Verez and stuff like that. Um, through Frank Zappa. Yep. We share those common grounds for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I was a big Zappa head for a while. and I think I wore out everything because now <laughs> I don't listen to it as much. But I think I'm coming around to it again. But I listened to it so much that it kind of like wore it out. But I know. I had every <laughs> Zappa record up to uh, Joe's Garage. And yeah, yeah. Every one of them, literally. Yeah, and, me too. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I moved out of a house when I was young. And it was in the basement. And I came back to get it. Oh, and no. the owner change the locks so oh that sucks but that's another oh, story no. yeah so that's that's the metal stuff yeah and i often think of you know how metal and, and classical are related and i think i think a lot of the the grandiose qualities of metal are similar to classical you know that kind of larger than life thing yeah that thing that yob does yeah yeah i'm a big yeah. fan of yob and friends yeah, me with too. those guys it's just when i hear that music i it just sounds like movements and in big, no, huge totally. pieces, and that's one of the uh, things that attracted me to them, and and to going and rediscovering my symphonic roots. Yep, I think Corrupted's like that too from Japan. They have these really long pieces that that have a lot of dynamics in them. They get quiet, and, and you know, there's a lot of metal out there. It's a little more dynamic. A lot of people think it's just like full bore all the time, but there's a lot of interesting. And Yob is like that too. That very dynamic sort of quiet sections and louder and i've always liked that and that's what i try to do with with my sky shadow obelisk stuff i try to weave together my metal and classical influences i think right well there's a, a whole bunch of people out there who may not be as well versed in metal as some of us and they think that warrant is a metal <laughs> band alongside and they probably don't know of things like death spell omega right yeah yeah i love death spell omega i think they're doing something really interesting um yeah i mean there's a lot of more fringe kind of metal that's happening that's that's really really interesting and and because i think under the umbrella of metal there are all these subgenres, but there's definitely a connection between all of it too i think right it used to be a dirty word yeah no i don't like that whole like subgenre thing like yeah, it's because I think back in the day, you remember it used to just be like Slayer was metal and Iron Maiden was metal. We didn't say like, I mean, it started to be like thrash metal and things started to happen like that, but but it was all under the same umbrella. I felt like you know. Yeah. And now yeah. now it's become a little more like things get put in a box, kind of. Yeah. Well, to me, there's always been two different genres of metal, and one is good metal and the other is bad metal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Warrant is bad. <laughs> Warrant bad. LA guns. <laughs> yeah. Ulcerate good. Yeah, yeah, there you go. But yeah, I was really upset when all that sort of hair metal came out. It, to me, it kind of like killed metal, you know? Yeah, well, it certainly ruined the And you a know, it's it. from the grunge thing. Like, like the, it was like the grunge thing going on and then the hair metal thing. And it was like, you know what I mean? It kind of like killed it for everyone. Yeah, I think that uh, the grunge thing was kind of a nail in the coffin for that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, that was that's what was good about it, yeah. Yeah, if anything but. good came out of grunge, it was putting to bed <laughs> and throwing dirt on hair metal. Exactly. Well, that's how I got into you, I think. Yeah, I was in college and my friend had the eight way Santa with the uh, you know the cover that we don't talk about anymore. But but um, <laughs> yeah, and I, I listened to that and I was like, wow, this is awesome, you know. Like, and it was something. It was also something different than the other grunge stuff that I was hearing. You had, I could tell you had more of that metal in you, and I appreciated that. I could hear those influences more. Mm -hmm. So out of the grunge stuff. But I like the other stuff too, but you had that cool like metal edge, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so here, we're going to take a break for a second and we're going to play one of your songs. This is the title track from Sky Shadow Obelisk entitled The Gift of Light.
dawn gives forth this light In our foray to his mortal senses A blight of white balls Blackest ocean depths up in the attic. The limited keys of a child. The wooden floor warm to the touch. The autumn sky. Shards of foliage against sapphire tessellation. Blackest ocean depths down into the 
That was the title track from Sky Shadow Obelisk, entitled The Gift of Light. I'm here with Peter Scartabello. Yeah, thanks for having me. First guest, I feel honored. Yeah, man, it's it's really cool, because uh, I think we've been friends since, believe it or not, MySpace days, I think. I don't know how I crossed paths with you, but... Uh, Yep. That's that was my first introduction, and I I remember reading your your bio on your website then, and I'm like, holy shit, this guy's real deal composer, instrumentalist, and uh, it was good to get to know you. And over the years, cool, yeah. And although we, yeah, although we've never met in person, I hope to remedy that. Um, like I say, the door is always open here at the uh, house. Absolutely. And uh, <laughs> maybe I'll make it out your way. Who knows. I have a question for you. How did you uh, How did you get into metal? Oh well, the first metal record I I got was uh, Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath, mm. and my brother gave it to me for Christmas yep. a long time ago. It's a good Christmas gift. <laughs> yeah, and before that, I was listening to stuff like uh, Disney records. You know, very young kid, and uh, yeah, and I, my favorite was Peter and the Wolf. Oh yeah, and the Tchaikovsky. Uh, yeah, I still love that. It's awesome. And, you know, so I was listening to classical and stuff, and, and it was more yep. more what I was into. My parents were never into that stuff, but, you mm. know. How about you? What was your first metal record? I think it was like, a, I don't know if you'd call it like Kiss metal, but, but probably like Destroyer, I think, was the first one. Yeah, that was an um, exciting time, man. Yeah, I, got, I remember getting that record. I must have been like eight or nine, and... You know, I thought it was the best thing in the world, you know. Join the Kiss fan club and all that. <laughs> right. I remember seeing them on some show in the early 70s. That's how old mm. I am. Uh, yeah. That was either Don Kirshner's rock concert or the Midnight Special or something. Oh, yeah. Don Kirshner, yeah. And they played Detroit Rock City, and it completely blew my mind. And Yeah, I, me too. <laughs> I got up off the couch and was, like, jumping up and down and... <laughs> My folks were freaking out, and uh, pretty pretty cool stuff. Uh, then, yes. then I bought my, my first record on my own, uh, which was uh, Judas Priest, Sad Wings of Destiny, and that completely changed my rec- my life. Yeah, and I love that album. To this day, I listen to it, and I'm like, holy crap, this is really well done, you know? Oh, it's great. It is. It sounds great, too. Yeah. Yeah, I think that album definitely made an impression on me. Um, that Judas Priest and, and like I said Iron Maiden probably Peace of Mind you know there's certain albums that sort of change your tra- trajectory I think I think like King Crimson Red that album too do you know yeah. that one yeah yeah I mean that's it's such a dark for the progressive rock it's really like a dark kind of metal edge to it mm-hmm. you know because I knew Yes before that and I was like that's fine and I love you know I love that stuff too but there's something about that King Crimson that just had a very sort of dark and and a- atmospheric kind of thing happening and yeah my favorite era of that is greg lake yeah yeah when when he was singing and playing bass is like man whoo no that's cool too but i like the the i think it's john wetton who's on the red album they have a similar voice i feel like yeah they do yeah but uh, yeah those two guys were awesome but yeah i like that the lizard album that's greg lake i think right mm-hmm well, it goes without saying, musicianship is top notch in that that camp. So yeah, absolutely, very, very inspiring, and sometimes depressing. I know because you look at the stuff now, and, and I think this comes back to the whole like bands playing out more then, and, and you know using tape and, and having to get the takes right, and rather than like being manufactured now today, a lot of it. I mean, not so much like a lot of the pop stuff obviously is manufactured, but but I think just in general. You musicians try to take shortcuts and it never works you know you really got to put the time in i think as a musician yeah there is no shortcuts to excellence there's there's no, lots of no. shortcuts to mediocrity but there are no shortcuts <laughs> yeah, exactly. to excellence and yeah yeah it, it, you know i'm pro- this is probably going to be an unpopular uh, opinion that i have about music and how many bands are out there clogging the freeways and and going and getting gigs and booking tours when they should be staying in the garage and getting their shit together first. Yeah, that's true. Maybe even never leaving the garage. I mean, there's (laughs) so much junk out there. It's, it's, it's shameful. But however, on the flip side of that, there's a lot of amazing bands out there 
that are doing yeah. it and they are making making yeah. a mark and they are putting in the work and the time and that's my opinion for what it's worth no I, I, I agree with that and I think in general like because of the internet and, and you know everyone can put up their music online so you have to kind of there are still great bands out there but you really have to weed through a lot to get there yeah so it's kind of a, a double-edged sword, the whole internet thing. And I think it's it's great for independent artists like me to kind of get out there and, and you know, and, and also be in control of, like, the money you make more, you know? Yeah, exactly. But by the same token, you have a lot of me- mediocre acts that are just putting their stuff online when they're not, like you said, they're not ready to sort of... I don't think they're ready to show the world their music yet, you know, but, but they'll, they do it anyway, you know, so it's... <laughs> So that's kind of... I mean, I understand excitement and yeah. being in a band and having camaraderie and putting together something that you had fun doing. I mean, I think that's amazing, and I I, I would not besmirch that in any way. Um, right. all, all that I'm saying is that uh, some people should just stay in the garage, and that's it. And, and that <laughs> by no means means that I don't think that they should do what they're doing. I encourage no, I people to be doing what they're doing. However, there is a lot of people out there that are like top-notch, next-level stuff. Right. My opinion is that you may be taking away from somebody who really is deserving of a show at a place, you know? Yeah, I know what you're saying. And part of that comes down to booking agents, too, you know? A, a lot... I know. With the advent of the internet, you know, all of a sudden, everybody's a booking agent. Everybody's oh, a totally. recording engineer. Everybody's a musician, you know? I know, I know. It's it's really an interesting time, and I, I think there's a lot of problems with it. But, but I think yeah, you have to kind of respect the craft enough to yeah. I mean, just respect music and respect the history of music, and and before you try to get out there and you know what I mean. I mean, you could do whatever you want, but that's my opinion. Like, I think you should know what came before too. You know what I mean? Yeah, and set the bar high. Strive for excellence. Right. Because a lot of bands are doing doing very like derivative stuff that they maybe don't realize had they maybe listened to earlier music, so it's in- interesting. But anyway, that's this is a big to- big topic. Or maybe they are doing derivative stuff because they have been listening to the old stuff. Who knows? It's an interesting time for music and and for everything really. I think. But I think. What do you? F- how do you feel about there being like less like major label and more independent labels? I guess. It's kind of the same. Well, I think that less major labels is a good thing. Um, Yeah. My experience is that if you're going to deal with a major label, get ready to deal with the devil. Right. And I don't believe in any deities of dark or light or whatever. You know, I'm I'm pretty much, you know. No, I know what you mean. (laughs) Whatever, but um, they're a big business. It's not heart and music and art. It's sure. a business, and their primary function is to make money. Yeah. So um, a lot of times they'll have people that are good salesmen that blow a lot of smoke up people's ass, uh, yep. A&R people. And, uh, sure. Anybody ever ask me if we should approach a major label? I'm like, yeah, but just be very careful. Right. Get a lawyer and get a lawyer to check out the lawyer you're getting, you know? No, Exactly. That's true, and I, I think, I mean, I've heard so many stories about bands that, that they go into the studio and they're like, the label's paying for it, and, you know, and all this stuff, and they run up this tab or whatever, then they, they don't realize that, you know, you got to pay that back, you know? So all your record sales are going to go towards the studio time that you put in, you know, and it's just, you know, it takes, you could have this big hit and not, and still not see any money for a long time, you know? Indeed. So it's, you know, so yeah, you have to be careful, I think, but, but I think, the interesting thing is that the labels don't seem to have as much an impact as they did before, you know? That's a good thing, right? And that's something I... I yeah, it is. I, I love being back in indie land as opposed to major land. Yeah, you're sort of in control of your own destiny, you know? Yeah, and um, there are some good indies out there, and there's some really, really good people working indie labels. Right. That, that's what I'll say. Was Inhaler, was that on a major label? I can't remember. Yeah, that was on uh that was on uh Giant Warner. Okay. That was yeah. the one then, right? Yeah. Okay. That was one of them. There was another one uh Infrared Riding Hood which was on East West Electra. Oh. oh right, that was on Electra, yeah. Mhm. Yeah. Have that on cassette, I think. <laughs> yeah. 
So, yeah, <laughs> enough yeah. about us. I mean, me, at least. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I feel like you're interviewing you, but that's we're all right. Gonna, we're going to take a second to play another one of your songs. All right. Maybe one off a different album. or Yeah, which one do you want? Are you going to play any classical stuff? Or? Yes, please. In fact, I'm going to probably be interspersing some of that throughout. Yeah, whatever you want. but Okay. Um, something off the new classical album, maybe. Okay, that'd be great. I love that, by yeah. the way. Thank you. Thank you. And here it is. Threshold movement number two for five B flat clarinets from the Peter Scartabello record by the same name, Threshold, on Ugoth Records. Yeah, how long do you, are these going to be? You don't, you're going to have to edit stuff, but. Well, my original idea was to keep it under 20 minutes, but I mean, this oh, yeah. is, it kind of takes its course and I don't get to decide. I think no. under an hour is a good idea. Yeah. And uh, we're at 38 minutes right now, so. Well, yeah, that should be good. You can cut it down too, whatever you think. Yeah, well, I'm going to be cutting down a lot of my shit because <laughs> yeah, right. it is a no-bullshit podcast. All right. Let's talk about uh, where people can find out more about you, though, and uh, okay. where would they go? Probably to the uh, You Goth Records site or, or just peterscortabello.com. Um, and then I also have a band camp, but you can get through that through there. So. Right. The You Goth Records band camp? Yeah, yep. Cool. So that's You Goth Records bandcamp.com ugothrecords.bandcamp.com correct? That's right or, or yeah or just ugothrecords.com which is that's my main site oh right yeah uh, you also have a uh, that's one thing I was going to remember is uh, you have a YouTube site where you do uh, composition tutorials and whatnot for sample libraries yeah exactly where can people find you on that what's your YouTube channel? Scartabello Music so youtube.com slash Scartabello Music yeah, I like doing that. I like to uh, to educate, sort of, you know, or uh, it's fun, the whole YouTube thing. You know, the more music you write and create, the more you want to create. It's sort of like a, I don't know, music, so it's such a mystery to me, sort of. And I think you you spend your whole life trying to solve that mystery, you know? Yeah, I think that uh, Nietzsche even said uh, something to the effect of, there is no God, but if he can be found, it'll be in music. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's a great mystery there and a great... It's definitely the most abstract of art forms, I think. And the fact that it touches people is really interesting to me, being so abstract, you know? Yeah, the, the great unknown. Yeah, and I think, you know, you know, being moved by music as a kid, you know, is, is what... When you say to yourself, oh, I want to do that, you know, I want to give that to someone else, you know? Because it's such a great feeling, you know? Yeah, I mean, I've, you know, I, 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 I've gotten so many great rushes from music and it's brought me to tears mm. and excited me and absolutely and given me power to move on um, 
it's, yep. it's no wonder that people listen to their favorite music while they're at the gym because it's it's empowering and it, it keeps you going. Yeah, totally. Music is a powerful drug. <laughs> yep. On that note. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on the podcast, man. I'm, I'm really grateful. And uh, Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. There will be more to come. And uh, do go check out peterscartabello.com. That's scartabello, S-C-A-R-T-A-B-E-L-L-O.com. Thank you, my Italian friend. Thank you. All right. <laughs> We have made the decision not to have any advertisers because we want to remain independent and fully self-supporting. If you would like to contribute to the well-being of this podcast, go to our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Tad Doyle. As always, we welcome your support. Subscribe to our Instagram and Twitter at noisefloor underscore. Also, visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Witch Ape Studio. Go to our website, taddoyle.com, for more information. Thanks for listening and spread the word.